All right, this is uh, Diving Deep Into Worship, and tonight we're talking about giving, okay? Um, this is, we're going to talk about it tonight, and we're probably going to talk about it next week, too, because there's a, I mean, we're going to get really deep into the scriptures about what not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament says about giving as well, and so that's a lot of material, so this will probably be a two-part class. Um but let's start off by going to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And what we're going to do, we got three of you here tonight. We're going to, um, I'm going to start with you, Jake. Okay. And whenever we have a passage of scripture to read, we'll just go around the table. That way everyone knows when it's their turn to read. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. This is a passage that we will be coming back to. <clears throat> Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure that I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Do not wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Okay. So what you see here is the churches were giving and... Uh, this is something that Paul told Corinth to do and Galatia to do. And there's that's the direct information we have, but there's some implications that we're going to see in this class that this collection on the first day of the week was not just something that when he wrote 1 Corinthians, that this was a brand new idea. Uh, there's some implications that this was something that they had been doing from the very beginning. But this is the pl only place in the Bible where you have the out-and-out -out direct uh, instruction on the first day of the week um, to take up a collection. Uh, it's referred to as the collection. Sometimes it's referred to as the contribution, um, giving. Um, th this is an act of worship, and we're going to get into the class as to why it is. Um, but it's not unusual for people to have a lot of misconceptions about this act of worship. Um, in fact, I, I've encountered some that in a, in a Sunday worship service, where you have the singing and the praying and the sermon, the Lord's Supper, and then it, at some point, maybe it's at the end or at the beginning or in the middle, at some point you have the collection. The, the plate is passed around. That's normally how it's done in American churches. And um, a lot of people will, might, or at least some, I've encountered some at least, that might say, well, well this was a, this is kind of like an intrusion on a otherwise spiritual service. Or some might look at it as, um, okay, this is uh, they look at it almost like the whole the whole assembly makes it almost like a consumer uh, in, uh, interaction. Like, okay, well, we've heard the preaching and the singing and the and uh, and the Lord's Supper, and so now, right before we leave, they pass the play around. So now it's time for us to pay mm -hmm. for you know. The, some people will look at it that way. Uh, some people look at it like I just don't like the idea of a collection being made of, of of asking people to give. But you know, if the church is to carry on its work, that's what has to happen. So, some will look at it as a necessary evil, and because of these misconceptions, um, it might be difficult to give the way that the Bible says to give, as we're going to see in this class. Um, especially if they, especially if they feel kind of compelled to give, you know, or uh, they give kind of grudgingly. Um, but what I want the, us to get out of this class is that if we can understand everything that the Bible says about giving, we, we, I hope that we see that the act of giving is a really spiritual manifestation of worship. And it's a source of wonderful fellowship, not only between us and God, but us and each other, and it's a source of great blessings as well. So, uh, Tatiana, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. Let's go ahead and read that. Acts 2, verses 44 and 45. 
All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Okay, so this is, if you look at the context, and we are going to be going back to the context um, really uh, in just a minute. But this is talking about the very first Christians, because this is in Acts 2 when the church began. This and the people who said, and when it says, and all who believed were together, that's talking about, if you look up at verse 41, those 3,000 people that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, the very first disciples, the very first Christians. And you'll see that it says that they were, they had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, keep in mind that if you read the entire chapter, the church began on a Jewish holy day called Pentecost. Pentecost is a Greek term that means 50 days. And Pentecost was basically, you can read about it in Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16. There it's called the Feast of Weeks. It's, it was a holy feast that took place 50 days uh, after Passover. Okay? And Jews from, it took place in Jerusalem at the temple, but Jews from all over the world, uh, all over the Roman Empire at that time, would be uh, traveling to Jerusalem to observe this holy day. And it was on that holy day in Acts chapter 2 that Peter and the other apostles preached the gospel publicly for the very first time. And so they were preaching to, to Jews who not only were living in Jerusalem, but Jews who were living all, coming from all over the world, and their original purpose was for a holy day, to observe Pentecost. Now, 3,000 of these Jews, and I, and I, I think it's safe to assume that of those 3,000, you had people, Jews who were living in Jerusalem, that was their home, but also you had these Jews who were from all over the place. 3,000 of them were converted. They were baptized. They became Christians. Now, they want to know more about this Jesus of Nazareth, whom they believe is the Messiah. And so they're probably not going home yet. They're coming originally just for Pentecost, but they're going to stay. They, they're going to stay in Jerusalem for a while. So the question is, how are they going to support themselves? Now, they probably had just enough money for a short trip, but if they're going to be staying for a while, well, how are they going to sustain themselves? Well, verses 44 and 45, uh, the, Jerusal the converts who lived in Jerusalem, they were, pro they were providing the needs of these other people, of these other converts. They were selling their possessions, they were selling their be belongings, they would take the proceeds. Just imagine having like a... Uh, you know, a, a yard sale, you know, and taking the proceeds, and then they would go to their fellow converts and say, I, I understand that you're, you need some money for food or you need some money for lodging. Here you go. Okay. So you see that the early church, they, they gave because they wanted to help each other. They wanted to support each other. This is not the first time that we, the only time that we see this. Look at chapter 4. And uh, Ron, if you could read verses 32 through 35. Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 32 through 35. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Is it 35? Uh, yes, yes, sir. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Okay, so here you have another example of the early church, the very first Christians. They were caring for one another. Uh, they were, again, uh, uh, they would sell property would take the proceeds, give it to the apostles. The apostles would distribute it to anyone in the church that had need. Uh, now, this was in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, the very first church. But if you keep reading Acts and then the New Testament, you'll see that this, that 
this would not just be within the local congregation. Um, let's go to chapter 11 of Acts. And I'm going to read verses uh, 27 through 30. Acts 11, verses 27 through 30. Now this is about, I'd say, 10 years later. Okay, 10 years later. And at this point, the church has spread beyond Jerusalem and beyond Judea. It's at now the Gentiles are being converted, and there's church there. There's a church in Antioch, which is uh, around where modern day Turkey is. There's churches in uh, uh, there's Paul the Apostle Paul is about to go out and travel across the Roman Empire and convert people and start churches. So the church is spreading. So this is that time. So Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 27. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius, talking about Claudius the Roman Emperor. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they took up a contribution, and the reason, I, and I'm going to tell you why I know that, they took up a contribution to send financial support from where they were in Antioch all the way down to Judea and Jerusalem, where the Jews were, the Jewish Christians were, because this famine would be affecting them. Uh, prices for food would skyrocket. All right. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15, and also in 1 Corinthians 16, remember, Jake, you read that. Uh, you remember how it said, now concerning the collection for the saints or concerning the contribution? That's what that this is referring to. This is referring to the contribution to help those those Jewish Christians who were living down in Jerusalem who'd be suffering from the famine. And you can read about that same thing in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 as well. So Romans 15, um, Jake, it's your turn. Could you read verses um, 25 and 26? Romans 15 verses 25 and 26. This is Paul talking, and he is writing to the church in Rome. But before I come... I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers that are there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Acacia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Okay, so here you see that another example of the early church caring for one another. You have uh, Macedonia is, um, that's around Greece. And Acacia is another term for Greece. So Jerusalem is way down here. Antioch, which we looked in chapter 11, was here. Then Macedonia and Acacia are right here. And he's riding to Rome, which is in Italy, way over here. And he's telling them about how he's been, they've been collecting money from all these different places. And I'm sure Rome is going to want to join in on this too to help the people in Jerusalem. So you see the early church cared for each other. Now, there's something that I want to bring out in the original Greek about this verse in Romans 15. Look at, um, look at uh, Jake, go ahead and read verse 27 too. I was meaning to have you read, sure. read that. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe it a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers who were in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do in return is to help them out financially. All right, so basically he's saying the, these Christians who are non, non-Jews living in Greece, they realize that they never would have heard about Jesus if it wasn't for those Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. So we owe you a great spiritual debt. The very least we can do is help you out financially when you're in need. That's the point that he's making here. In verse 26, um, here's what my translation says. It says, Macedonia and Acacia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now, contribution, what is your 
What does your uh, version say again? Offering. Offering. Okay. So mine. You must have a similar translation. No. New Living Translation is what this is. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, I'm reading from the NLT. So right. contribution or offering, okay? In the Greek, that Greek term, I'm not going to... It's konia, I'm not going to... I can. I guess I can spell it for you, for those of you taking notes. It's K-O-I-N-O-I-A-I. K-O-I-N-O-I-A-I. And here's what it means. I will obviously hear it means contribution. Elsewhere in the New Testament, in English, it's translated communion. Hmm. It's also translated fellowship. Now, fellowship, the word fellowship, what that basically means, the term itself, it means partners. You're sharing together. You're partners together. The Bible talks about fellowship in a bunch of different ways. It talks about fellowship that we have between us and God. And that's and basically what that means is God and uh, God and Christians are joined together. They're partners. They're sharing together. They're communing together. But here, it's the fellowship has to do in a financial sense. In that, the Gentiles looked at Christians in way over in Jerusalem that they never knew. They probably would never even meet them in their lives, but they recognized that they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're going through a difficult time. They're going through a famine, and they're going through inflation, and they can't afford food. We're going to give them money. They're partners. There's a sharing there. There's a communion there. There's a fellowship it's family. there. It's family. It's that's, a, family. that's a good way of putting it. So keeping in mind that this word, contribution, literally means fellowship, I want you to go back to Acts chapter 2. And remember how, um, Tatiana, you read verses 44 and 45 earlier? Mm -hmm. Now I'd like for you to read verse 42. Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay, now you see how fellowship is mentioned here? Now that's in English, but in the Greek that this was originally written in, it's the same word that's translated contribution or offering in Romans 15. Now, when you have a word that has several definitions, how do you know which definition applies? Like, take the word will, for example. W-I-L-L. Am I, do I, if I say I will do the dishes, is that the same thing as saying I've just prepared my last will and testament? Mm-hmm. No. You, but how do, how do you know? You look at the context and how it's used. Too. Exactly. So you, you read the context earlier. You read verses 44 and 45 where it talks about how they were selling their possessions mm-hmm. and they were taking the proceeds mm-hmm. and they were giving it to anyone who had need or they would give it to the apostles and the apostles would distribute it. So the context of the Greek for fellowship in verse 42, the context shows that this fellowship is referring to contribution, most likely. That, it, that they were, right from the very beginning of the church, they were contributing to help each other out. Now, look at uh, verse 42. Look, uh, in, and keep in mind, this is in the context of the Jewish Holy Day of Pentecost. That was the day the church began. If you look at Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, you'll see that that Jewish holy day, it always took place on a Sunday. It always took place on the first day of the week. So right here on on a Sunday, the church begins. They're baptized. What's the first thing they do? It says they devoted themselves. Or King James Version says they continued steadfastly continued steadfastly or devoted themselves, that terminology in the Greek means they started a habit. So right there on a Sunday, what did they start the habit of doing? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles were preaching to them. That it was on a Sunday. Do we still preach? Do we? Is there still preaching done on Sundays? Yes. And to fellowship. Let's uh, fellowship, contextually, contribution. 
breaking of bread, literally in the Greek, breaking of the bread. It's a reference to the Lord's Supper. And prayers. Is the Lord's Supper taken on Sunday? Yes. yes. Uh, do, people, do Christians gather together to pray on Sundays and, pre and hear preaching on Sundays? And what else do Christians do on Sundays? They're, they take up a contribution, which is exactly why later on in 1 Corinthians 16, 10 years later, you remember there, the Apostle Paul's going all throughout the Roman Empire collecting money from all these different churches to, to help these starving Jewish Christians out down there in Jerusalem. What did he tell the church at Corinth to do? You read it. On the first day of the week, let each one of you uh, lay by in store as he has been prospered. Why the first day of the week? He says so that no collections will be made made when I come, uh, literally put something aside on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Why not if, why couldn't I, well, you know what, I am going to put some money aside. To, when Paul gets here and he, uh, when Paul gets here, I'm going to take this money that I put aside and give it to him so he can help those Christians out. But I'm, I get paid on Friday, uh, so why can't I just take uh, uh, a few, uh, some, some of the money from my paycheck on Friday and just stuff it under my mattress until Paul gets here. Why did why did Paul specify on the first day of the week? Literally in the Greek, by the way, what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 16 is on the first day of every week. Right. On the first day of every week. Why? Because that's when Christians were coming together from the very beginning in Acts 2. The day of Pentecost was a Sunday. They were coming together from the very beginning to hear preaching, to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, pray together. Other passages bring out that they would be singing together. But what else were they doing? From the very beginning, they were taking up contributions to help each other out. Okay, and That's one of the reasons why giving is a part of worship. Because in Acts 2 verse 42, all these other things are worship. The praying is worship. The Lord's Supper is worship. Hearing a message from God's Word is worship. Uh, and singing's not mentioned here, but we talked last time about how singing is worship, and that's done on a Sunday. Well, what else did they do when they assembled to worship? And they did it right from literally day one. <laughs> they gave. Um, so, uh, I want to bring that out because if you read 1 Corinthians 16, that passage, and it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... I instructed Galatia, and now I'm instructing you. You could get very easily get the sense that this giving on the first day of the week, that this was just a special circumstance that applied then for that particular problem, and it doesn't really. It's not really something that applies to us today. I could see why you could, one could come to that conclusion. But if you, if you take the the entirety of the biblical data into account, which is something God tells you to do anyway. In Psalm 119, verse 160, it says the entirety of your word is true. If you want to know what the real truth is on any religious matter, you have to take all of what the Bible says into account. So if you take into, into account everything that the Bible has to say about Sunday giving, you see here that a extremely strong case could be made that when he wrote 1 Corinthians 16, he was not giving them brand new information about Sunday giving, that it was something that they had already been doing already from the beginning. It's just that in this particular case, he was saying the Sunday collection, we're going to now send it to these saints in Jerusalem that are that are struggling. Is that instruction Psalms also helps you prove the Bible. If you're looking at um, consistency through a book to see if it's really inspired by God, that's an excellent way to do it. Excellent. Very true. For instance, if you go to other religions, they don't do that. They're that's very true. Involved. Very true. We're gonna, um, The topic we're going to be talking about once we're done with worship as a whole, and I guess we're probably going to start that in a month from now, is exactly what you're talking about, Christian evidence is proving that the Christian religion is legitimate. And that's a very good point that we'll be making there.
So we see about giving that it was done in as a part of worship, and we're going to see why it's why it's appropriate that it's done as a part of worship in just a second. Um, but we've also seen uh, that it was done something. It was something done on Sundays, and it was done literally from the very beginning of the church. Um, now, we already looked at 1 Corinthians 16. Um, let's go over to 2 Corinthians. And Ron, I think it's... Uh, well, Tatiana, you read. Yeah, you were the last one to read. So, uh, Ron, it's your turn. Could you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5? Now, let me give you some background on this. That's 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and in chapter 16, he was talking about that collection, okay, on the first day of the week. He wrote 2 Corinthians anywhere from six months to a year later. It's almost like a follow-up letter. And in chapters 8 and 9 of that letter, he starts talking about that collection again. And it's the same collection he was talking about in chapter 16 collecting money to help the saints that are struggling from the famine down in Jerusalem. So, with that background in mind, uh, Ron, if you could read chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what Gaius Highness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift to the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. All right. Now, in, the, in this study on giving, we will be coming back to chapter 8 and we'll be going on to chapter 9. A lot, but number one, you see this is still talking about supporting those struggling saints down in Jerusalem. But notice how he and you remember in Romans 15, he remember how he had said that Macedonia had contributed. Well, this he's going into greater detail about how the Macedonians gave right here. Now notice, uh, notice what he says here, verse one. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. And then he starts talking about how they were supporting the how they were supporting the financially these the Christians in Jerusalem. What does grace mean? Unearned favor. Unearned favor, right? Uh, God giving you favor or a gift that you don't deserve. He says, I want you to know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. And then the, he, the only thing he talks about is how they were giving to support their brethren in Jerusalem. So what he's basically saying is by them giving, and we're going to see that they couldn't, we could, they couldn't even really afford to do it, but they did it anyway. By them giving to support their fellow Christians in need. That's the grace of God being given to them. So by them sacrificially giving, God is giving them a gift they don't deserve. Now, what does that tell you about our giving? If when we give, what we're doing we're taking part in a privilege that comes from God and we don't deserve it. I want you to think, well, I want to tell you a personal story, okay? About 13 years ago, I was in between churches. Since preaching is my profession, that means I'm in between jobs for nine months. Nine months. Uh, Beth worked a plurality of jobs, and I worked a 
plurality of jobs and just to keep the lights on, you know, difficult time in our life. We were attending this church uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. We weren't even really members of that church because, again, I'm looking for a church to preach for. They already had a preacher. It was just a pl place we were going until I could find somewhere. One of the elders of that congregation, that he, that he knew my situation. I, we, we'd been attending there uh, on Wednesday nights for about you know, a couple months. And, and we'd attend on Sundays whenever I would in, wasn't tr interviewing on a Sunday somewhere else. So we were there for about two months or so. And he takes me aside after services on Wednesday night. He takes me aside and he says, how are you doing? You know, you got any prospects yet? You know, I was like, well, you know, I sent this resume out and a month from now I got this interview lined up, you know, and, you know, Chick-fil-A, I'm working there. And so we're, we're getting... We're, we're getting things done. Yeah. Is it, is it difficult? Yeah. He's like, I just don't, don't, don't think me forward. I just, I'm asking cause I care. Are you having to go into your savings? And I said, yeah, we are. And it's, um, uh, it's really taking a big bite out of it. And he says, is, I imagine that's pretty stressful. And I said, yeah, especially for Beth, it's stressful. You know, he said, well, uh, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. Okay? And he gives me a hug, which kind of startled me, you know, man-to-man -man hug. Type of thing. It was like a full-on embrace. Okay? And, you know, I appreciated that, you know. Go back to my car, go home, taking off my jacket, and there's something in my jacket. And I reach in there, and it's an envelope, and I open up the envelope, and it's $5,000. $5,000. And there's a little note in here from in there from him and his wife. It says, we love you. Don't even think about trying to give this back. We care for you. We just want to help you. Now, that I haven't seen the man in at least five years now. Don't know if I ever will see him again. I don't even know if he's alive now. His wife passed away not long after that. Okay. It's 13 years later, 14 years later, and I am about to tear up talking to you about it right now. I feel the same if I was in that situation. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> That's the best way that I can explain or illustrate the idea of this concept about how giving to help others is God giving you a privilege you don't deserve. Because that man made such a difference in my life by his generosity. It changed my life. It really helped us out. It, it, it helped our marriage. It helped my morale. I was thinking about giving up preaching. It just, it did so much good that even he is not aware of. And God basically was, that what he did for me was so powerful that it's probably one of the best things that that man has ever done in his life that he's not aware of, of how good it is. So do you see why God is saying when you, when you give, it's, it's a privilege that you don't deserve. It's, I, you are giving, it, it's by my grace that you can give. Do you, do you, does that make sense? Everything we have is a blessing from him. Yeah. Exactly. We don't deserve any of it because we're all sinned. We've all fallen short. We don't deserve any goodness from him. It was like, I think you made a point one time about people complaining about God not being fair. If we all got what was fair, we would all go to hell. Yeah, pretty we much. We wouldn't have any goodness or blessings in this life. 
Yeah. Or the next one. But look at something else here. Uh, the Macedonians, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They are they are financially very poor. They are extreme poverty. But in spite of being extremely poor, they're very rich. They're rich in joy and they're rich in... In, they have an abundance of joy and they have a wealth of generosity. Any of you guys seen It's a Wonderful Life? I think I saw it when I was a kid. Okay. Uh, my dad used to love that movie. Jimmy right? Stewart? Yes. Yeah. Black and white movie. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of the few movies out there. I think it's It's a Wonderful Life and Forrest Gump and when, when Jenny dies at the end and Ghost when Patrick Swayze leaves Demi Moore at the end. I, I will start crying. <laughs> But here's part of It's a Wonderful Life. Now, you don't know the story. It's this guy, and all his life, he's been wanting to leave the small town he lives in. He just wants to go out and make it big, you know, go see the world and get, and get rich. But his weakness is he just cares too much for people. And so every time he's just about ready, like he might literally have the, the plane tickets in hand, that something will come up, like his father would pass away. And now he, he feels obligated to take over the family business. But he's thinking, I'll just take over the family business till my brother graduates from college. And then my brother can take over and then I can go. Well, his brother comes back and his brother says, well, I just got engaged to be married and and my fiance's dad is going to get me into the ground floor of their company. And so now he's stuck. But then he saves up and saves up. And then he gets married. And so he's like, well, at the very least, I can have a honeymoon. And just go off and me and my new wife can go and travel. And they have an envelope full of thousands of dollars of cash. And they are literally on their way out of town. And I think that that's when the stock market crashes and the Great Depression starts. And so his family business is a savings and loan and so people are just crowding in and his family business would have, gone, would have gone under they didn't have the money and then he realizes he has thousands of dollars in this envelope here his honeymoon money and he basically gives all of it but two bucks away that in one day to keep his business afloat and then for the next 15 years it's like uh, he's he, he's helping out tons of people with his business, the savings alone, but he is stuck in that town. And then through uh, through one of his employees just making a, a, a just a, a an honest mistake, his employee happens to lose thousands of dollars on the day that the bank examiner is coming in to audit them. And so now the bank examiner is, and his competition. Uh, who wants to get him out of the way, call the police on him and about to arrest him for supposed misappropriations of funds and fraud. So now he's thinking he's about to go to jail, and he's and it's Christmas Eve, which is why it's a Christmas movie, and he's suicidal. And so God up in heaven sends an angel in the form of this he, he looks a little bit like you. You know? <laughs> this, uh, I say he looks more like you. <laughs> yeah, right. like and uh, Clarence. Uh, he sends Clarence, yeah. Clarence the angel down. It looks like an old man, and and oh, and okay. to get and to get the to get the um, to get to get the guy to stop being suicidal and realize that he's really had a blessed life. He makes it. He miraculously makes it as if the guy never did exist, and so now he still exists. But now everyone in town has never heard of him. So he's walking around town and he's just seeing how terrible everyone would have, everyone's lives would have been if he hadn't been there. And he realizes it and he begs for another chance at the end. He's crying and God basically gives him his life back. And he gets so happy that he just runs home. He's kissing his wife. He just can't, and the police are there and he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He's just like, it's so great. But then just when they're about to arrest him, Suddenly, the whole town shows up at his door, and they just keep filing, and it's the very last scene of the movie, and that this is what gets me crying, because the entire town just comes in, and all of them, they, they have 
laundry baskets full of cash, their own savings, and they're just dumping it at his feet. And, and each one of them is saying, uh, I wouldn't have a home over my head if it wasn't for you, or if I, uh, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have done this. We heard you're in trouble. We heard you need something. Well, you know, we are here for you because, I mean, you've been there for us. And the last line of the movie is someone raises a glass for a toast, and the, the guy's name is George Bailey. And he says, here's to George Bailey, the richest man in town. Of course, he's not the richest man in town because really that's just a couple of thousand dollars that they've laid at his feet there. But he is the richest man in town. And that's what this verse is talking about with the Macedonians. Their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. There, that's another thing that giving does when you when you give to help the work of the church on Sundays or when you I, I it could be giving to help anyone in need maybe I mean you've all seen um going driving driving up a exit ramp and you and you see someone and they got a sign there saying I'm hungry you know well you know there's been many times that I've uh, you know they're on an exit ramp you know, that means there's a fast food place nearby, and I'll go in the drive-thru, and I'll pull in, and I'll get them, I'll get them a bunch to eat, you know, especially if they have kids with them. Come back, here you are, here, here you are, you know. There is something about that that makes you, from a spiritual standpoint, it makes you a very rich person. Because spirituality, being a true faithful Christian it, be, coming to church and reading a Bible or owning a Bible that is just a very small part of it because what it what it really is about is serving God and serving others and when you serve God and serve others that makes you very spiritual that brings you very close to what God would have you to be and that's what makes you spiritually rich. These guys here, look at verse 3. They gave according to their means, but it says they gave beyond their means. And they gave of their own accord. We didn't ask them to do it. They, they, we didn't hold a gun to their head. They wanted to do it. It says, verse 4, they were begging us. Begging us for, look at how they phrased it, for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. The favor. You know... A lot of people don't look at giving to help others as as someone doing them a favor. Usually we look at, well, I'm doing you a favor by giving this. And usually, let's be honest, we, I'm sure we've all been there. I don't really want to do this, but I just my conscience is bothering me. You know, I, I, okay, here you go. You know, that's not them. They're like, we, please let us be a bar, part of this. Please let us have the, please do us a favor by letting us give to help these people way over there in Jerusalem that we've never met. Please help us to do this. It's almost like Paul knew that they didn't have the ability to do it. And he's trying to say, hey, no. That's probably, please. that's probably, well, in fact, um, further on down in chapter 9, uh, there's a hint that that's exactly what, he was doing. He he was ba probably basically saying, you know, you guys, stop. you guys don't you you guys don't know where your next meal is coming from. You no. don't really need to do this. No, we want to do it. You know. But look at verse five. It says, "And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us." That's the key. You want to get the the most out of giving, whether it's putting money in the co collection plate or whether it's giving uh, throughout the week. Whenever you see someone in need, you want to you want to do it the way that God wants you to do, it. and you want to get the most spiritual benefit out of it. You first have to give yourself to God, because when you truly give yourself to God first, and you realize that this is what His will is for you. And this is what this is what this is what being a Christian is all about. Then you'll want to do it, you know. Yes. 
Okay, so what if you see someone on the street with a sign saying, you know, I need money, whatever the sign says, mm -hmm. but you know for a fact that they don't need the money for food or for a roof over their head or for their kids, that they're actually going to use it on their addiction, like drugs mm. or alcohol or cigarettes for all that matters. Well, let me give you a, let me give you a real life situation that happened to me one yeah, time. I, bet I, have one. I was preaching in Illinois. And uh, the church building, we had uh, a worship service on a Sunday night. It started at 6 o'clock, and it was probably about 5.15. And I was already at the church building, and there was no one there yet. And right across the street from the church building was a gas station. Okay? And so this guy comes in, and he comes to my office, and he says, Hey, man, um, I'm, in, I'm in a bad place. And he get, tells me I you know, lost my job, all that. I was wondering, could... Could I get some money for food? And I said, well, I don't have the time to go to the grocery store because worship service is about to start in 45 minutes. But tell you what, I will take you across the street to the gas station here, and I'll get you whatever food you want out of there. And I was fully prepared to spend, in my mind, it was probably going to be $25, $30 I, you know, he could go through the aisles and pick out whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just getting to the road in the front yard of the church building and waiting for the light to cross. And he says, uh, "Well, do you think you can give me some cigarettes?" And I said, "No." I said, "I'll give you. I'll get you food. And I'll get you anything mm -hmm. you want to drink other than alcohol, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to get you cigarettes." And he just turned and walked away immediately. And so there's a passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's verse 21, and it says, test all things. And that's a good thing to do it, when it comes to the scenario you're talking about. I do not give people cash, okay, unless I know them very, very well. Okay, I, if it's someone I don't know very well, I will ask what they need. And if it's anything that they need legitimately like food or something like that, I will go buy the food and give them the food. Like the guy on the exit sign, uh, I'm hungry. I'll go to McDonald's and I'll get him food. Okay? Because your point is very well taken. You know, a lot of people will, give, will say one thing when in reality they're wanting it for drugs. You're, it says in Galatians 6 verse 10, as you have opportunity, do good to everyone especially the household of faith, will do good to everyone. It's not really doing good if you're enabling someone's addiction, but it is doing good if they're starving and you're keeping them alive. Okay. I, now, with all that said, I will give you one, one more thing to think about, though. You remember the, par the parable of the Good Samaritan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have the Jew, he's mugged, he's left for dead, priest doesn't give him the time of the day, the Levite doesn't give him the time of the day, a Samaritan, which Bible history says the Jews hated the Samaritans. And they were true. They were they, and the Je Samaritans say the Jews. The Samaritan comes along. It's the Samaritan who takes this Jewish stranger and binds up his wounds, takes him to the, end, to the hotel. And you remember what he says to the guy at the hotel? He says, I want you to take care of this guy and here's money to take care of him. And if it turns out that you require more money than I had given you to take care of him, then the next time I'm through here, you let me know, and I will pay you. The Samaritan is opening himself up wide to be conned by that guy, isn't he? Because as soon as the Samaritan rounded the corner and left, the, the, the innkeeper could kick that guy out of the innkeeper of the hotel, left him to die, and then a month later, the Samaritan goes by and says, oh, you know what, that guy, he had to stay with me an entire month, and I've kept, here's an inventory of all the food and everything, and you owe me lots and lots of money. He could have conned the guy. He opened himself up to it, but he was willing to open himself up to it to help this guy. So what does that teach us? The Bible says, test all things. But the Bible also gives the example of the Good Samaritan. So my, when you take both of those into account, here's, here's what I would say to answer your question. Do your due diligence. Ob, don't fall for what is an obvious con. 
uh, protect yourself, uh, give, if at all possible, the actual things that they say that they need, rather than just the money. But if for some reason you can't do that, it, you know, maybe something might come up, or, you know, whatever situation you're in, and if you're faced with a choice now, do I give, and maybe maybe this guy might be taking advantage of me, or I don't. And there's no other option. You either give or you don't. Then God would say, go ahead and take the risk of being conned. And just do it anyway. If that's the absolute only choice that you have. Now, in my experience, and I have people here as a preacher, there's hardly a week that goes by that people will not be ringing the doorbell out there. That's why we have a pantry. Okay? I've encountered enough. Uh, I've been in this enough so that I have a pretty good idea of when the need is legitimate or not. And that we have the resources set up here so that I don't need to give them cash. That I can give them food. And even, you know what, even, I'll be honest, even giving them food, maybe in some indirect way, who knows, I might be enabling them even by doing that. Maybe the reason they don't have money for the food or they lost their job is because of their addiction. But they're still starving. They still, they're still in need. So... When all is said and done, if you're going to make a mistake, make a, it's better to err on the side of wanting to help the guy. But still do your due diligence as much as you can. Does that make sense? That, that, that's what I do. Okay. Uh, down in Atlanta, went to this restaurant one time, me and the wife, and there was um, outside, there were several homeless people over right outside. And we're, we're hungry, you know. Uh, went in and paid for a takeout thing. And, and it was su some well-known restaurant for Southern cooking. So we're talking fried chicken, mashed potatoes, r rolls, green beans. Tried to stuff all that into the takeout box. I mean, it was, it had, it was a lot of food. Gave it to them. Shake hands. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Get in the car. We're pulling out. And I see in the rearview mirror the guy take the my takeout thing that I gave him and throw it in the trash. Okay. So I just basically was conned out twenty dollars. I think what he was really hoping was that I would give him money. But you know what? In the end, God's gonna bless me because I was acting on good faith. And I wasn't gonna give him money. He said he wanted food, so I gave him food. Now if that means if he's still lying to me, that's between him and God, you know. And but I, I to, to also go along with your question though, I'm remembering that even to this day. And so if I ever am at that restaurant again, if I see the guy again, then no, I'm not mm -hmm. gonna do it. You know, does that make sense? That makes sense. No, that's a very good question that you asked. So, all right, well, tell you what, we're gonna stop there. And we're going to be talking, we're going to get into 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 next week. And what we're also going to do, and you know, this might turn into a three-week thing, I don't know. Yeah, it don't matter if it does or not. But uh, we're going to get into tithing from the Old Testament. Um, one of the main questions that uh, people have uh, is, do Christians tithe today. In fact, it's a lot of people say yes, you know, but tithing is something that is actually only mentioned in the Old Testament as a command to the Israelites. So we're going to talk about that, not only about whether it's, for, whether it's part of the New Testament or not, but we're also going to really get into the Old Testament and see what they were to tithe and why they were to tithe and get and examine all those passages. So That'll be next week, and if we don't get to it next week, then it'll be the week after. So, any uh, last-minute thoughts or questions? Anyone please, else? please accept my apology. I forgot Clarence was an old man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I'm not going to do that because there was a Lifetime <laughs> Channel sequel to It's a Wonderful Life that came out in the 90s in which Clarence came back, and he was a very handsome young man. And that's obviously the one you were thinking of. 
Exactly. When you said that, when you said that, he, yeah. he looks like me. I, that's just how I'm taking it. So, uh, any other thoughts or questions? Anyone have? I think uh, the discussion about not giving them money uh, brought, maybe brought up a good point. See if you think about this, that there's other ways that you can give or contribute that aren't necessarily essentially financial in means. Mm -hmm. Or if they are financial, it's in an indirect way. Right. You know. Give of your, your time or your efforts. Yeah. Labor's a good example. Mm -hmm. Labor's a good example. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, somebody at the church needs help with something mm -hmm. around the house. Mm -hmm. Go out there and take mm -hmm. care of it for them. You know, to yeah, the men, like the LJ men would meet uh, every Tuesday, I think it was, or once a month, I forget, mm -hmm. and have breakfast. And then they had projects lined up uh, for going out and helping people in the church and sometimes in the community helping fix, make repairs on houses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Especially one older couple, the man had become disabled. And sometimes he got to church and most times he wasn't able to. But uh, we went out and made a ramp for his house and things <coughs> like that. And so. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this. Um, to go along with what you were saying, my wife's dad, he passed away suddenly. Um... I think it was August 2nd, 2002. She and I were, uh, it was a Saturday. We were scheduled to go to Six Flags. We did go to Six Flags, but uh, it was so hot that uh, she got uh, sunstroke. Beth got sunstroke about 45 minutes after we arrived and fainted. Mm -hmm. And so the park very generously gave us a refund. And we went back to my apartment. We were watching a movie when her brother called and said, get her home. And this was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, she, got, she got in her car, I got in mine, kind of had an idea because her father was uh, not in very good health. But he was young, he was my age, um, I think. And um, he had had a massive heart attack that morning and was killed instantly and lay basically in his room until the rest of the family got home and discovered him. When she got there, uh, I'll never forget what, how she reacted when she found out, but one thing, she, she was going to a different Church of Christ in the area than the one I was preaching at at the time. And this was a Saturday. It was in around starting about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. And that there were about, I would have to say, maybe 300 members of that congregation, and I, at least 75% of them showed up at that house on a Saturday in the middle of the afternoon, and they stayed for hours to the point where traffic was blocked on the road, and the neighbors on both sides of the house had to open up their houses just so that to get the just so that the people would have a place to go there was that many people mm -hmm. that showed up and stayed until nine ten o'clock that night on a Saturday their free day right mm -hmm. but that they dropped everything when they heard and they gave her their time lots of time to give comfort and solace to this to this family I have never forgotten that, and neither has Beth and her family. And was any money given? Probably not. But there was a lot of time and a lot of love that was given, and that was just as much a benevolent act as helping someone on the side of the street with, with money. So your point is very well taken. Christian, what we're talking about with giving and financial giving is what the emphasis is on right here, but basically what we're talking about is one of the basic tenets of Christianity. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, but you love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what giving is. When you give to the work of the church, when you give to the church on a Sunday, you're giving to support the work of God. So you're giving to God. When you're all, and some of that work is helping others. So you're indirectly helping others. And throughout the week when you decide to help others by giving money or time or love or energy or whatever, you're putting others before yourself. 
You're putting God before yourself. And that's really what this is it all about. And by putting God before yourself, that's one of the reasons why it's worship. Because it's, it's, it's a show of gratitude to God. Any other thoughts? One thing I was like going Baptist to until about seven years ago. And mm -hmm. every time the church doors open, they pass the plate for right. the service. Mm -hmm. Wednesday night, doesn't matter, whatever. And reading the Bible and understanding now that Sunday, mm -hmm. in the morning, typically in the morning, is the time to give to the church. And in Church of Christ, you never see the plate again until the next Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So that's always impressed me, that the Church of Christ really pays attention to the Bible. We do, it's just a matter of this is what God said, and so we're doing what he said. Nothing more, nothing less. And if there's a need that comes up on a Wednesday, you know, that's one of the... Uh, the we're going to see in this class that the Bible does bring out the idea, the concept of a treasury, and, you know, money that's given on Sundays goes into the church treasury. Uh, I Here, past four years that I've been a preacher, there have been people that have showed up on Wednesday night because they know that the church is open around the Bible study. Could you help us? And the elders of the church will uh, take them, uh, you know, right down the street to uh, the hotel off of 53 and pay for them to have a lodging for the night if that's what they need or take them to the grocery store and pay for some food. And they'll use a church credit card. Well, where's the funds come from that credit card? Mm -hmm. From the first day of the week offerings, you know. So, you know, the even though the, the Bible specifies on the first day of the week, and so that's when the collection is made, that that doesn't mean that giving in, in, in other ways can't be done uh, throughout the rest of the week. It's just that the actual collection, that's what he said to do. So that's what we do. So, any other thoughts? Oh, this doesn't get too long. But no, go ahead. Go ahead. My stepson and his wife uh, took in a girl, little girl's foster child. She's about a year old when they got her. And at about five and a half years old, the court gave her back to her parents. They were heartbroken, so were all of us. But uh, eventually... The reason they did, they did was because the mom gave up drugs, supposedly, and went back with the husband, and they had an apartment and all that. But at some point, um, the man lost his job and wound up living in a car on the street. And this is like this winter, you know, it got pretty cold there for a while. And I was so impressed because the aunt uh, paid a good stay in a hotel one or two nights when it was so cold. And yes, it was family, but my goodness, she's not in a good shape to do that either. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that guy who gave me five thousand dollars. His wife passed away less than a year later. Now I don't know the details behind that, but it, I can't help but wonder: was could any of that gone to for her medical bills? Was she was this something that they needed that money for? I don't know, but what I do know was that that card had a feminine handwriting to it. So it was the wife who wrote out, don't think about giving this back to us. So that she was very much completely in agreement with this. And it's that sacrificial giving. It's that Macedonian, they, it says they gave beyond their means. That's what you were talking about. That's what happened. Probably might have happened with me as well. But, um, and it's definitely what Jesus did on the cross, didn't it? I mean, he gave beyond his means. He gave his life um, for us. I want to share with you all a couple of prayer requests. Um, you all know Janita from church. Well, her mother passed away. And, uh, you know, um, Barbara. Now, Barbara and Bill, they sit on the back row. Barbara is um, an older lady with white hair. She has the nickname Gaga. I, I think that's a... A pseudonym for her grandmother, I guess, Gaga. You know, it makes me think of Lady Gaga mm -hmm. myself. But uh, she's in the hospital. They uh, brought her to the hospital in Redmond about a couple of hours ago for high blood pressure. And so um, let's uh, keep them in our prayers. And uh, Janita's going through a difficult time. You know, Ruth, Ruth's husband passed away last week, so remember Ruth in your prayers as well. So let's pray. 
Father God in heaven, we bow before you with deep gratitude. We're talking about giving, Father, and you gave so much, you continue to give so much, all for us. We cannot thank you enough or even begin to comprehend the magnitude of what that means. When we're talking about giving, Father, we pray that this study will help us to be more generous and more caring and compassionate for others. And we pray, Father, that when we give, that it will be an act of worship and adoration to you for all that you've done for us. This we pray in your Son's name, because we understand that it is through his giving of his life that we have even the hope of heaven. Father, we lift up to you Janita and Ruth and Barbara and all of their loved ones. Barbara's health problems and Janita and Ruth's losses help us to comfort them and be them be there for them. Father, we again have nothing to say but thank you for your power, your love, your grace, and your compassion. Please be with us as we leave and go home and keep us safe. And again, help us to become more of what you would have us to be. Amen.